I've always been a fan of your music and it's an honor for me to, uh, to have you online on Zoom. So thank well, you thank very you. much. Thanks thank for you. having me. It's, it's going to be a great pleasure. Tony, where are you right there now? I'm home. I live in uh, Kingston, New York, what we call upstate New York, because it's north of New York City, but uh, south of, Can of Canada, of course, and uh, Quebec. And what's the weather like today? It's kind of nice. Fall finally hit, so it's a little chilly, but, but I'm liking it. I, I'm one of those people who doesn't love the summer, so looking okay. forward to some cool weather. Same here. Same here. So what's your goal for today? What, uh, any projects like in the immediate? Uh, uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, always behind me is my, I've divided my, my studio room into two parts. Recording is over there. Visuals is over here. My family is visiting. My daughter's visiting from LA. So it's family time, which is very important and precious. And so little of it these last couple of years. You're preparing for another tour leg? With King Crimson? Yeah, King Crimson's going out in about two weeks. We're going to Japan, a lot of paperwork. I spent a little time each day with the, on the visas and the uh, COVID stuff. Uh, but it'll be good to do another, maybe a couple of weeks, three weeks in Japan. Awesome. And then that's it for this year for King Crimson. And uh, we'll take next year when it comes. We'll see what it brings. Tony, is it possible to talk a little bit about your education? Like what was the initial spark to, to, to bring you to music? A very supportive family. My parents believe that you got to study piano, whether you like it or not. And then you have to pick an instrument. You don't have to be a professional musician. They didn't count on that. But you have to have this musical education, part of your upbringing. They were very supportive. And at a pretty young age, for no reason that, that I know of, I said, I want to play the bass. In my case, it was one of those amazingly lucky. I wouldn't say lucky. It was from inside. I didn't know why. I asked them when they were quite elderly, if, if I ever said anything about why the bass, they said, no, you just like the bass, want to play the bass. And now many, many years later, I still like to play the bass. <laughs> but if I can play good music on the bass, I'm gratified. I'm doing what I love to do and seems to be what I was born to do. Tony, anybody who knows you now, they know that your style and you're, you're, you're like a virtuoso of all kinds of different styles. Is there any routine or any exercise or any scale that really opened you up? That's an interesting question, Kevin. Um, I grew up classical first, and I went to music school, serious practice all day on the upright bass. So I, I did a lot of practicing when I was young, and practicing is for technique. In classical, you're never making up your part, right? You're going to be technically able to play the symphony. And when the conductor says, you can play it faster, you got to play it faster. Okay, so when I got into the world of making up my own part, first of all, I was very happy. I was ha very happy to not be one of eight bass players playing the same part, which was not only what I did, but what I was aiming at doing my whole life to be in a symphony orchestra. So when I was uh, uh, first exposed to making up, yeah, it's up to me what I play, then I, I switched from working on my technique so much to learn how to fashion a really good part for that music. I've noticed in recording and in playing live too. Uh, the people that I'm working with, they, they really like when I play what's best for the music, not when I play the most technical thing mm -hmm. or, or, or the, the most Tony Levin thing, even just what's best for the music. So that, that I'm comfortable with that I focus on that. What a, a variety from classical to pop or, or prog rock. It's really all over the place uh, in a good way, because most people, they, they stick to one discipline. Huh? Either they improvise a lot or they stick to their charts. What a pleasure to have you uh, be able to, to, to adapt to both situations. Was there any role models back in the day, any mentors musically that, that had a, a positive influence to contribute to your success? My older brother, Pete, three years older, was a musician from the, probably the day I was born when he was three years old. Keyboard player, then a French horn player. He also went into classical. He went to Juilliard and then he went into jazz before me. So he was always leading the way. It strikes me to be a contributing factor to your success, your ability to communicate. But when you think about it, the bass players almost always making music with other people. Inside, I wanted to make really good music, but I wanted to do it with, I didn't want to be the, the guy out front. I didn't want to be the only guy. Maybe that was in the back of my uh, 
soul when I chose the bass. Uh, where did you learn those those beautiful values to listen, the ability to listen and and to uh, to observe? For sure, opening yourself up to anything artistic or or good books or you know being close to people who are creative artists of any style that helps you in a way that helps you somehow know the right note from the wrong note the quality of that painting or of that broadway show or of that movie that helps you to be more focused uh, you asked me earlier about mentors and i've been listening very carefully to a lot of bass players for a long time since i was a kid I mean, it, when I was a kid, it was uh, uh, Oscar Pettiford, a great jazz player, not the most famous jazz bass player, but my brother had a whole collection of records that he was on. And he played, I can tell you this, he, he played simply and a little bit melodically, and he just caught the groove. He didn't do anything to draw attention to himself. But I, I when I listened to it, that was a long time ago. And when I think of those records or listen to them, I know all the bass notes. So it really hit home to me what he did. And this guy was just playing the right notes with the right feel. When he soloed, he played a beautiful solo, short. And when I think about it, <laughs> the last few years, I thought, if I had to describe the way I'm trying to play, I'm trying to play the right notes with the right feel and not draw, draw attention to me only if, it's, if the music calls for it. So amazingly, the, that nine-year-old kid was learning from that mentor who I've never met or never took a lesson with. Can you name him again? Oscar Pettiford, P-E-T-T-I-F-O-R-D. For that, you'll have to turn off airplane mode. <laughs> 2006, on the album Resonator, you have a beautiful song called As Fragile as a Song. Um, very, very heartwarming, very... Uh, gentle and kind and human well thank you first of all i'm, I'm thrilled that, that you noticed that song i can understand from the little i've written songs that you go and you play and you, all this thing and you really never are sure that anybody really got it it's got a great backstory if you're going to be interviewed about a song it's nice if there's a story with the song this one has a great song story peter gabriel had been in, in a process of visiting with apes bonobo apes in atlanta at the university of georgia who were in a program of communication. These were the best uh, non-human uh, communicators. They could understand language. And he was going down to try to make music with them, two of them, two of the superstars of that, that genre. And I had said, even though Peter's in England and I'm in the US, I said, P Peter, the next time you go down, if there's any way I could be with you, I would love that. So he called me only a day before. Can, I, can you be in Atlanta tomorrow morning? And I flew down and uh, it was kind of crazy getting into the, the place. And, and I, I had my bass. I brought a yellow bass. I thought maybe <laughs> it looks like a banana. Maybe the, I really knew nothing. I know a lot more now. And, and it was uh, an amazing experience. It was a, uh, in a lifetime of amazing experiences that stands out as one of the most, the most unique and, and uh, very moving and very special to summarize it, Peter would speak to them and they would understand. One time the ape was playing, for instance, like this, uh, Pan Benicia, and, and Peter said, Pan Benicia, I liked it yesterday better when you were playing with one finger of each hand. And she stopped and the rest of the, the hours that she played, she played like this. It was only a couple of hours and then a taxi came for me to take me back to the airport to fly home. And, and the, the driver said, uh, isn't that the place where they have monkeys? And, and I, in that moment, I realized that uh, it's going to take me a long time to process what, what happened. Somehow, in the way we artists or musicians, or I'm not a songwriter primarily, but uh, it came out as a song. This is a beautiful book, and I, I really Thanks. loved it. I really enjoyed it. Images from a life on the road. And there's so many beautiful pictures in there. We can feel the ecstasy on stage and we can, we can feel the, the energy and the hype, but also the little fragile and vulnerable moments of your, mm. of your teammates. You're a smiley person. You have a good humor, mm. a sense of humor. People like that. People need that in a band. It breaks mm. tension after a while. And, and, and you, know, you seem to have it together. So my question is, 
what would be like your routines or your healthy habits that you do to prepare to bring that to the table in, in a band, which which helps glue it all together, like like the bass? And it's an interesting aspect of what it is we do because we're collaborating. And to me, a band is a lot like a family. I do tend to be a positive person. But way before I met you, Kevin, I learned not to do music and bands that I don't want to do where I'm going to, you haven't seen the, the unhappy Tony. Okay. <laughs> if I can see something coming, that's like really not me. I just say, oh, I'd rather not do that. And well, if it's a studio project, it's not that long, but if it's on tour for a long leg, well, that's a different story. Exactly. But still the consistency in your success is a, is a balanced human being because success is not always about limousines and champagne it's 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 no. about you know just having consistent work with a smiling face and a loving family it's it's a it's a it's a great blessing whenever we talk about success i'm tempted to back up and 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 point out that at least in my mind success doesn't have a single definition so for in my case i was a kid and i wanted to play good music on the bass that was my success so yeah, I've been very successful and I continue to be by those standards. I think it's a good idea to be aware of how you define what success is for you and to be willing to, or, or to be observant about your life. And if maybe that turns out not to be what makes you feel great, to be able to change direction. We ought to give some care to defining our own uh, uh, version of success. Social media, um, the respect you have for your fans I think uh, some of it is is because the way I feel about audiences. You mentioned fans. I don't I don't think about fans, but audiences. When we do shows, I I really feel it feels like we're together, the audience and the band. So I feel very connected. But when I put up pictures that I took from the stage of the audience, boy, people love that. They were mm -hmm. wow. Alone. So and eventually, I I have released it earlier this year a book of the best of the photos I've taken from all those years. I was taking the photos anyway, but it was very hard to share them online. If there it is, ah, what a guy. If you can imagine I'm touring Europe and I take a great picture of Peter Gabriel going on his back into the audience on Lay Your Hands on Me and with a viewpoint no one else has. Uh, so that's one of the things about my career that I feel really good about is that that gives fans of whatever band I'm touring with a chance to see what it's like for us, what it's like backstage, how the guys were before they went on. And the best of all, uh, here's what it looks like when we bow. Here's what you look like. You can feel like, okay, this the audience has given something to us that has an effect on us. It's not just like we played our thing and then there's this picture. You can tell. You look at those mm -hmm. pictures and the energy in it, and you can you can deduce that we need that energy. We live on it, and it's what keeps us going. And and doing one show is a great thing, but to do 20 shows in a row and and to do it month after month and year after year. We need that that thing of we're all in it together. Awesome. Very, very cool. Lastly, any uh, advice that you can give? I think one useful thing I have to say to, to, to people beginning in music or, or in the early, actually almost at any stage, there are times in this career where you get rejected, where you mm -hmm. do a track for somebody and they don't want it, or you join a band and they don't want you, or you audition for something. It, it kind of it kind of hurts you a little bit deep inside because you you give your music, you're giving yourself in a way, and it's yourself. You know that it's not yourself that's being rejected, but in a way it feels like it. So I, I would like to, I think it's worthwhile to share that that has happened to all of us and continues to happen through our career. Less, but even a guy who's who's quote unquote successful, that seems to be a part of the, the genre of, of making music and best to know that. And if it happens that you have some bad luck and and are rejected for something that you thought you did pretty well at, uh, maybe it will help you a little bit to keep in mind mm -hmm. that, that it's happened who the, the best drummers in the world, they could all, we could have a panel and tell stories all night about being rejected when we thought we shouldn't have. And so you share that with everybody else and muddle through a way to, to carry on and, and the music uh, is worth it. And the career of being mm -hmm. a musician is worth it. Awesome. Willpower. Tony Levin, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Thank uh, you, Kevin. Mean, means a lot to me. So very uh, pleasant. Anything new coming up? Kind of in the writing stage. I'm, I have a little more touring with, with King Crimson and then Stickman and Tony Levin, the guy, uh, both writing album, not done. 
So no point in talking about it. And thanks for asking. <laughs> Tony, thank you very much. I wish you a blessed day and uh, I'll keep in touch. Thank you.